Uh, young adults, this Friday we have a gathering for you. Uh, a guy named Mark Clark, he's a pastor of Village Church in Canada, uh, fastest growing church in all of Canada. He's from British Columbia. He's going to be here. He's speaking, and uh, he just wrote a book called The Problem of God. It's going to be a phenomenal night. So 7 o'clock this week at the training center on Friday. It's going to be awesome. Uh, it's, my wife and I are so excited to be a part of this community. We've been at New Life for like five and a half years, like Wes said, but we're so excited to be in Central Kitsap because we think uh, amazing things are coming and that God has giant plans for this campus and this season and this time. And so we're excited to be here. You guys get a treat in having Melissa. Like, I'm okay. Melissa is the best. That's her right there. We celebrated our fifth wedding anniversary last month, and we're just so excited for uh, this next season. I promised myself as a kid that I was going to marry a Southern California girl, and I did just that. Melissa's from Fullerton in Orange County, right by Anaheim. She could actually see the fireworks from Disneyland outside of her window as a kid. How magical is that? Want to know something more magical? My father-in-law was the first Donald Duck in character at Disneyland ever. Ever. So actually, all the magic was probably taken away for her. Uh, But anytime I'm like a little bit afraid of him, I'm like, Donald Duck, okay, we're good. We're golden. Um, But but man, we're we're excited. This weekend's a fun one for me to be speaking um, because this day, a year ago, about four hours from now, a year ago, my wife and I were sitting at home and my daughter decided it was time to come into the world. And we got into the car two hours later. She was real calm about it. She's like, go get the mail, go to the bank. I'm like, are you sure? And then we went, um, we got to the hospital at 5, and Sadie was born at 2 a.m. on September 4th. So Labor Day. Um, and we're, we're so excited. Uh, it, there's Sadie right there. I couldn't pick one picture, so I picked nine. My favorite is the troll picture, where she just looks like a little troll. She's gotten cuter. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be honest, uh, but, but my heart for that little girl has grown so much. She's born at 2 in the morning, and she's nostalgic, so every morning at 2 a.m., she reminds me by waking up, and we party together. Um, it's fantastic, but she flipped my little world upside down. My time is spent differently. My money is spent differently. My Friday nights are spent differently. The things I think about, the things that I I care about, they've changed dramatically since this little girl's come into the world. And God's just been growing this father heart in me that loves to celebrate the little things that she does. Every little step she takes, every tooth she cuts, I celebrate, I mourn, and I celebrate. Every, Every sound she makes, word she says, I'm loving it. But the thing that God's really been growing in me more than anything is the hope that I have for her future. The things that I get to pray over this little girl uh, every night I just like sit thinking about this little girl and I pray that she would become an includer. That she would walk into a room and look for the lost and the lonely and draw them in. That she would be an inviter. That she would be an advocate for those without a voice. That that would be the heart of, of my little girl. That she'd be a woman of courage, conviction, and character. And so these are the things we're praying over her right now. And as I pray these things over her, God's just been whispering in my heart, I have prayers for my people too. The way you pray for your daughter, I pray and I hope and I long for my people. I long that they would be a people that would step up, that they would love their city well, that they would be people of conviction and courage and action. And so today, I want to unpack kind of the heart of God for his people. What is the church going to become? And I really think there's two types of churches that exist in the world. One is the church that exists for themselves, and one is the church that exists for the mission of God. There's a church that exists for themselves. What can we build? What can we bring in? How can we protect who we have? How can we make sure that we feel safe? We're in control. This is comfortable. Or people that go, no holds bar. We're going out. We're loving the city. We're loving the world. It's going to take courage. It's going to take faith. But we think a God is big enough to show up in the middle of it. There's arrows in churches and arrows out churches is what we say here in New Life. Where all the arrows point right back in or all the arrows are pointed out to the community. And I actually get the arrows in church. I understand it. I grew up in a family that I think was a little bit arrows in. We were deeply Southern Baptist, which is why I can't dance, um, or what I blame. But my mom, she she had this idea of it was not the church for the world, it was the church or the world, and you had to choose where you were going to engage. And so my mom said, you know what, we're going to take my five kids and Not my five kids, I have one. Uh, The five kids in my family. And she homeschooled us, and not in like a a healthy homeschool way, in like we don't want you to talk to other kids, so you're homeschooled here. 
And, and, and then she put us in every Christian after hours organization that she could. Any Royal Rangers in here? Anybody? Yeah, a couple, okay. 4-H, I showed bunnies in county fairs. I couldn't hang out with the world, but Holland Lot bunnies were okay. Um, uh, there was one time where we boycotted Disney while my father-in-law was Donald, D it's the whole story. But my favorite thing she ever did was she bought this thing called Curse Free TV. And it was this box that you would connect to your TV and it would go in and it would read the closed caption ahead of time, find any offensive words, and then whenever the offensive word would come up, it would mute the TV and throw a closed caption with a replacement word. I constantly read, I'm gonna kick your toe. <laughs> and after a while, I'm like, Mom, I know what that means. Like, if I call you a clown, you think it's bad. It's bad. I just don't let that happen. My brothers one time watched Saving Private Ryan with Curse Free TV. They're like, it was muted the whole time. It was ridiculous. And I always laugh at my mom over this, but since I've had this little girl, I kind of get it. I want to protect her. My friends come home, and they say, my six-year-old heard this on the playground. And I'm like, I, I'd rather her not. I'd rather her not see some of the things I've seen, hear some of the things I hear, know some of the things I know. And I, I think my heart is to protect my kid, and I think a good parent's heart is to protect their kid. But there's really two ways you can protect a kid. You can pull them away from the situation, or you can prepare them for what they're about to encounter. And every time you pull away, you become arrows in, but every time you prepare, you begin to move towards the heart of God and sharing the heart of God and knowing the heart of God. I think God's been preparing his people to step into the world. I think it was the work of Jesus to step into the world and be a people that have made a decision that we're going to be here. The tension point is this, though. The tension point is uh, there's always a, a bent where you're moving back to the mission of me when you need to be moving towards the mission of God. You're always moving back to the mission of me when you've got to be moving towards the mission of God. So I think us as a church, we have to make a decision. Who are we going to be? What are we going to be okay with? Is our goal for this church that we would grow a little bit? Is our goal that this beautiful new building that we have would stay within budget, that there'd always be a program for your kid, a program for your youth, a chair for you, and coffee, dear Lord, please, lots of coffee. Or is our heart for this church that it would transform the city? That, that we would be so interwoven to the fabric of Central Kitsap that to pull us out would be to uproot the city that we would have that big of an influence, that people would know us and that they would see us and they would see the hope of Jesus and they'd see the heart of Jesus and they'd be different because of it. I think the church is at a really, really interesting time in history because we're the most educated we've ever been, the most connected we've ever been, and the most resourced we've ever been, but churches in America are closing, closing their doors faster than they ever have. And the dying churches are scary, but the scarier part is that there are living churches that have forgotten what they're living for. How do we become that church that doesn't forget what we're living for, that we know what we're living for? I, I hear this all the time because I think we're beginning to match the culture. People come into the church and then they, they leave a church and they, they, they say, I left because I wasn't getting fed. I just wasn't getting enough. I've worked at three different churches now, all of them different, all of them different strengths, and every single time people go, I just wasn't getting fed. It's because we have this consumeristic culture. Here's the problem. I don't think we're not fed enough. I think we're actually overfed and under-exercised. The church needs to begin to live out what we know, live out what we have, be a people of action. It's what Jesus did. I picture that moment in the upper room. Jesus is about to have the Last Supper and teach him what communion is and have this moment. And before he does all this, he goes and he grabs a pail and a towel. And he walks over to the disciples, and I imagine all of them kind of gasp, thinking the exact same thing. Oh, please don't make me the towel boy. <laughs> please don't, don't you give me that towel, Jesus. That's not what I, because I, give it to John, not me, because I, I know what will happen when I get to Peter. Peter's going to be like, oh, you missed the spot, and I just don't want to deal with that guy. And Jesus gets down on his hands and his knees, the son of God in the posture of a servant, grabs the feet of his disciples and begins to wash their feet. He looks them in the eyes. See, I don't think you can serve people if you can't see people. So Jesus gets down to a place and he looks them in the eyes and he serves them and he's washing their feet. And he goes to the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. And he doesn't get 
stand up and give you a giant Greek lesson. He stands up and says, as I have done, woo, watch out for that. As I have done, you should go do also. And he doesn't send them to a throne, he hands them a towel. We're not people of a throne, we're people of a towel. We're people that are going to move that way that we're gonna serve so much, that we're gonna live out the heart of God. The life of the church is the heart of God, and the heart of God is that we would serve people. I've been chewing on that all week. The heart of God is that we would serve people. I said to my wife, these are the things we're gonna talk about this week, and she goes, well, we better start to do something, huh? I was like, you are the worst. Yes, Holy Spirit, we should start to live this out. So if you're looking for a big idea today, it's this. God did not call the world to the church. He called the church to the world. God didn't call the world to the church. He called the church to the world to the world. God never said, hey, go build a great church. Jesus actually said, I will build my church. That's the work of Jesus. He said, you go love your city. Care for those in need. Serve people. Be present. Take care of people. And then you, you look at the book of Acts in scripture. It's um, right after the gospels. The book of Acts is a story of the apostles. It actually stands for the Acts of the Apostles as they take the towel and go launch the church and begin to live a life called on the mission with Jesus. What does it look like for us to live this way? And the beginning part is uh, Acts 1, 8. It's the last words of Jesus, and it's the beginning of the church. And Jesus says this, and I think we need to take a look at it. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And I just kind of pause there. Do we realize that we're a people of power? Like, does the church realize we're a people of power? That when Jesus raised himself, uh, uh, died on the cross, raised from the grave, went to heaven, he ascended there, he put the power in the people. Sometimes the church limps along. Like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Are we cool with that? Are we okay here? Cool. No, we're called to live actively, to live as people of power. Why do we have power? So that we can be his witnesses. You'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. The proof's in the pudding. Oh, and by the way, you guys are the pudding. You're plan A, and there is no plan B. People are watching the way you live, the way you talk, the things that you stand for. They're watching the way you treat your family, the way you treat your coworkers, the way you drive, those of you that have New Life bumper stickers on the back. I won't do it. I don't want that to be a reflection of my Jesus. Um, (laughs) They're just watching the things that you do. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, which is a disciple, you're standing in Jerusalem. So you're like, in Silverdale, in Judea, in Kitsap, in Samaria. Samaria was the hated worst place you could be, so Pullman, and to the ends. (laughs) Go Huskies. And to the ends of the earth. You're called to go be his witnesses. Do you think the disciples had a different mindset the next day they walked through their town? Oh, this is mine. This is my place to be. God has called me here. Whenever I go on mission trips, I notice my attitude changes. I actually bend more towards the mission of God, and I start asking questions that the mission of God asks, like, what are the needs of the city? I start to do things like pray for the city. I walk around. I, I try to meet practical needs, real needs, in like the most practical ways. I invest, I care about the city, I think about its culture. Then I come home and I think about my car and I think about my house and I think about my family and I think about my job and I think about my, about my friends and I think about my TV. I need a new TV. I think about my, like I just start to think about all these things and the, the mission of me overwhelms the mission of God. And I think as a church, we need to realize that when we decide to live on mission with God, we have to reorient our lives around the mission of God. God's mission can't match our lives. Our our lives have have to match God's vision. And you have the book of Acts where I think they do a great job. And there's this crazy moment in Acts where 3,000 people are added to their numbers. Boom, one day. It's this crazy moment. And then you go, okay, what now? And the church had to start to live every day, ordinary lives. And what did that look like? And we have it here in Acts 2. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Right there. That's our job right here. We are committed to meeting, to sharing, to, to gathering together, to eating food together, to praying together. That's our job. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. 
They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. I see three things there that the early church says that we need to begin to live out. First is this, good deeds, goodwill, good news, in that order. We will be people committed to good deeds, gaining goodwill, sharing good news in that order. I grew up in this like deeply Southern Baptist church where there was this conviction that you had to share the good news as soon as you entered into a room. So I'd be like, Jesus saves. Hi, I'm David. (laughs) Hey, have you heard the good news about Jesus? You're a sinner and you're broken, but we should be friends. I don't think that's how it works. Our Our culture isn't looking for our ideologies. They're looking for our actions. They don't care about our thoughts if they can't see our heart. I heard somebody say the other day, if you ain't helping, you ain't helping. Which I unpacked as I thought about this. I was like, what does that mean? It means if you're not investing, if you're not sharing, if you don't have skin in the game, I don't want to hear your thoughts. I I don't want to know what your critiques are. If you're going to help, I'll let you help. But help by helping. So that's why we start with good deeds. Look at, what, look at what that scripture says. It says, And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared their money with those in need. They said, Oh my goodness, this Jesus, Jesus thing changed us. He handed us a towel, so we're actually going to live like it. The church's purpose has never been to survive or to thrive. It's always been to serve. 100% serve. Never about this chair never about this building, never about this coffee, never about just making sure our kids are perfectly safe up there. They're going to be safe, but perfectly comfortable up there. It's always been to serve and to love and to care. And that should be the most fun thing we do. We should have a blast doing it. If these deeds start to feel like a chore, I think we've missed something. I heard it said, if your get to become, if your got to become, no, excuse me, I'm going to get this. If your get to becomes a got to, you've forgotten your gratitude. If you used to get to do things, but now you're like, you've got to do something, you've lost your gratitude. Our heart is that we would do good deeds and we would be good neighbors. Look at what Jesus says. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise the heavenly Father. This is how the church grew in the beginning. You look at the scripture right here, that's how they grew. You actually look at the early church in like the early 300s, there's this thing called the Council of Nicaea. It's where um, the, the what, is, what is the scripture, like what is contained in the scriptures was formed. It's where we got our Nicene Creed, which forms a ton of our theology. And there's this little order decreed there that I think actually changed the landscape of how the church lives and moves in communities. And this is what the order said. Wherever a cathedral exists, a hospice must exist as well. Wherever there's a building full of followers of Jesus that meet, there's an outreach center full of, follow, center full of, full of followers of Jesus that reaches out. Wherever we gather together, there's people going and giving and moving and meeting the needs of the community. The church decided, you know what, we're actually responsible for these people. I had a moment in college that God just kind of grabbed my heart and like flipped all of this on me. I went to a small Bible college in Southern California called Biola. And by, ooh, a fan. And Biola, uh, Biola was playing UCLA in basketball, which was just a riveting game. Um, <laughs> it was horrible. We got destroyed. But we were on our way and we stopped at a gas station. And at the gas station, I walked to the restroom. And on my way to the restroom, I saw this old lady walking right behind me. It was just one restroom for this whole gas station. And she was clearly homeless, clearly sick, using a walker, clearly had better days. Now I walk into the restroom and I look around and it's absolutely filthy. I look at the toilet and it's absolutely disgusting. And I hear this little voice in my heart go, clean it. And I said, no, thank you. (laughs) I got a game. I got to go to UC Biola's playing UCLA. It's a big deal. and, And I just hear that voice say, who's behind you? I thought, well, there's this woman. And Jesus goes, whose responsibility is this? 
And then clear as day, in the back of my brain, I heard it's nobody else's responsibility. So I grabbed that towel and I cleaned that toilet and I walked with those words ever since. It's nobody else's responsibility. Hey, church, it's nobody else's responsibility. Third graders need to learn how to read. Whose responsibility is it? Nobody else's responsibility. There's foster care kids that need safe homes in Kitsap County. Whose responsibility is it? Nobody else's. It's our responsibility. There's two penitentiaries for women in Kitsap and Mason County. What are we going to do? Whose responsibility? It's our responsibility. There's homeless youth. Whose responsibility? Military people are moving into the county. Whose responsibility is it to say hi and welcome? People are struggling with PTSD. Whose responsibility is it? It's nobody else's responsibility. If everybody's responsible, nobody's responsible. So church, let's be responsible. This is gonna be our thing. This is our county. This is our city. We're gonna go out and we're gonna love it. And good deeds lead to goodwill. You see it in the scripture right here. It says they worshiped together at the temple each day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals together with great joy and generosity all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. I was looking that up to make sure at the very end where it says all the people. I wanted to make sure I didn't teach this wrong. And so I was looking up to see if it's all the people of the church or all the people in general. And so I'm cross-referencing all these references and they all begin to say the same thing, but I got to the message version, version and I just loved it the best. Here's what it says. People in general liked what they saw. <laughs> I love it. People in general liked what they saw. Not just the church. Anybody who saw the church living liked what they saw. The church made commitments in this culture and in their city and in their time. It says they went to the temple every day. They committed to be consistent. They opened up their house for food every day. They committed to being in community. And they praised God every day. They committed to praising what God is doing in their community every single day. And the church began to grow and it began to grow and it began to, began to grow. Why? Because they kept showing up. They developed goodwill and people liked what they saw. Listen, people, should, uh, people might hate you because of Jesus, but people should never hate Jesus because of us. People are going to love Jesus because of what they see. There's a community uh, down in L.A. that has this organization right in the middle of it. It's called the Dream Center. And I've gone to the Dream Center a couple times, and I've never seen an organization gain good, the goodwill of the people in the city more than the Dream Center has. If you watch the people react whenever a Dream Center truck comes into the, uh, the block, people are excited. If you're wearing a Dream Center shirt, you have instant relational clout because they've been doing good deeds for so long. They feed over 50,000 people in the community every year. They clothe thousands of people every year. They take people out of drug addictions, alcohol addictions, substance abuse of any kind every year. They have discipleship training to help with low-income housing. They're on Skid Row every single week. They've just been consistent in there. And I, I was talking to their leader, the guy who planted it, planted it, and I said, what is it? Like, what's the secret? And they go, we believe this. Whoever lasts in the city the longest wins it. It's like, that's not sexy. Like, it's effective. We've just won it. People love us. Why? Because we do good deeds over and over and over and over again consistently. We're committed to it. We keep showing up. We keep loving each other. We keep loving them. And they're just drawn in. And we've seen life change after life change after life change. We've outlasted the drug dealers. We've outlasted the broken families. We've outlasted the, ab the abusers. Hey, New Life, where do we just need to sit in the community the longest? Who needs us to just be here the longest? Where are you going to say, I'm going to commit to this, and I'm going to outlast all the brokenness. I'm going to point to Jesus over and over and over and over again. Good deeds lead to goodwill, and goodwill leads to open hearts to hear the good news. In that order. And we have the best news there is. And look what happens in the scripture. It says, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Good deeds lead to goodwill, which leads to open hearts to the good news. And do you know what happens with the gospel? It wins everywhere it goes. Wherever the gospel is planted, it grows. We're going to plant it with good deeds and goodwill. We're going to share the story of what God has done. 
in uh, Colossians 1, it says this, the same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives just as it changed your life. If you've been affected by the gospel, if the mission of God has reoriented your life, don't you think the same thing can happen to the people in the city? They're who we're called to. I've never seen um, the process clearer uh, of good deeds leading to goodwill, leading to the good news being shared uh, than when I went to the Dominican Republic with Children of the Nation. They're an organization that does uh, ch children sponsorships, and so they go into the most impoverished communities, and they say, what do you need? They begin to meet the needs. They put in educational systems. They put in water. They put in housing. They put in latrines. They meet the basic needs. Then they move people into those cities to be with the people that they're helping. And as they do that, they begin to gain goodwill. And as I entered into city after city after city, I saw every single time the gospel had been moving and shaping and forming wherever COTN went. And that was so cool to see, but the most powerful part was we went on a vision trip to go see what's next. What community are we going to impact next? Where are we going next? And we stopped on the, the border of the Dominican Republic in Haiti, walked down this hill, crossed this river, illegally entered into Haiti, which is kind of cool, bucket list. And we walked back up this hill, and walking up the hill, I had no idea what was going to be on the other side. And I got to the top, and it plateaued, and I saw refugee camp after refugee camp after refugee camp. Like, I've seen poverty before, but I've never seen this. The houses, you can't even say houses, the shelters were plastic, cardboard, tarps, milk cartons, T-shirts. Giving just like the slightest amount of shade to the most exposed place you could be in 100 degrees, 100% humidity. If it's gonna flood, it's gonna flood right there. And we're walking through, and the founder of Children of the Nations is walking with us, and he's casting his vision. This is how we, this is the questions we ask to figure out the good deeds we need to do. This is how we're going to build the goodwill. And this is how the gospel is going to take root. And we're standing between two refugee camps at this point in time. And he's sharing his heart and building this up. And out of my corner of my eye, I see this little girl, about seven years old. I don't think anybody's loved her for a while. There were no parents around. There was nobody there to take care of her. She was just standing there. And I heard in my heart, go talk to her. So in the middle of this guy casting his vision, I just walk right past him. It's like if Wes was talking about the training center. I was like, yeah, 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 buddy, whatever. And I walk over to this little girl. And she speaks Creole. And I'm like, I was just working on my Spanish, so we're not going to do this. And I kind of like, I look her in the eyeballs. And I'm like, what's universal? a little high five. It's like, sweet. Are NUX universal? They are. Boom. It's like, how about the universal low 10? Not a thing. She didn't know it. She just places her little hands on my hands. And I'm like, in this moment, deciding, do I like make it funny and dance? Or do I see her? I got down on my knees. I held this little girl's hands. I looked at her in the eyes. You know how, like, you can't, like, help a people if you can't see the people, if you can't know them. I just got a chance to see her, and I slowly dropped her hands, and that little girl just threw her head into my shoulder. And I got to hug that girl for about 10 seconds. I don't know if she's felt love in a really long time. I know we could do good deeds, good will, and hopefully share good news and totally forget to love and see people. And in that moment, I thought, I hope we do something here. But now I hope we do something for her. And I let go of her, and we go our separate ways, and the, the founder of Children of the Nation looked at me and said, what just happened? I was like, well, I gave her a high five, Nux. No, 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 what just happened? He's like, I don't know. He goes, I think you just saw Jesus. I think you just saw the heart of Jesus. I think you just experienced the spirit of Jesus. Man, New Life, my hope is that we go into the city and our action today is serve the city. 
be with the city, care for the city, take care of them, be the church. But don't serve and forget to see people. Don't serve and forget to love people. Don't serve and forget to take care of people. Can we be the church that serves the city but sees the people so clearly? That's our call. Let's be those people. Would you pray with me? Jesus, you are close to the brokenhearted. Would you be with us when we're broken? And would you draw us to, draw us to those that are brokenhearted? Could you give us eyes to see the people and hearts that won't stop until those needs are met? And could we sit long enough to get to know people and know stories? Would your gospel come in and would it win? Would it win in Silverdale and in Paulsbo and in Bremerton and in Port Orchard and in Belfair and in Tacoma and Squim and Bainbridge Island? Or would your church grow because you're growing it, because you're good and you're faithful? Praise in your name.